I've talked about how these stories will link up to other stories. When I start researching one, I find something else. And I wanted to bring a story today about two women who were murdered in Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. And um, when I began reading, I came upon them. I'd heard of their story before, but I was actually researching and reading about a a, a serial killer. And these two women may have been victims of his, even though they've there's been no evidence of that. But they were named as possibly being victims of his, and that's how I came upon their story, and I decided to do a separate video about the two of them. I'm going to continue um, the video about him and the other victims that were linked possibly to him. So it's all just one big um, whirlwind. It, it's like a dust cloud of people all connected and mixed and the possibilities. And they're still waiting DNA on a um, some evidence that was found at the crime scene in this case. Um, I don't know if they have DNA and evidence from these other men or not. I'm sure they do since they were arrested and spent time in jail. They were probably entered into CODIS, but I, one of the accused was, uh, died in 2003, so I'm not sure if his DNA was kept or not. This is from Blue Ridge Outdoors. A Murder in the Woods, The Mystery Behind a Double Murder in Shenandoah National Park. In May of 1996, Julie Ann Williams and Laura Winans walked into the woods and never came out alive. Their double murder sparked shock and fear in the area. They were backpacking and camping. About a year after their death, Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods was published and opened a previously unknown chamber inside of me. At the time, I was just a kid in Ohio who took to solace in nature, but Bryson's kooky memoir about walking the Appalachian Trail became an obsession. I was enthralled with the idea that one could walk over 2,000 miles without ever leaving the forest. Now, I want to give a personal note on this. This m book was made into a movie starring Nick Nolte and Robert Redford. And it's an absolutely fantastic movie. If you have not watched it, I'm going to tell a little something about it uh, on a personal note. I, after watching that movie, I, in the movie, they cross this dam as part of the Appalachian Trail. They walk across the top of this dam. And this is called Fontana Dam, and it's over Fontana Lake, and it is in Bryson City. And I made a special trip there because I wanted to see this place. And I fell in love with this place, and one day I hoped to, to go there and just stay and never come home. And I can imagine how people get to see those places every day. For us, and even me living in eastern Kentucky, it's only about a three-hour, four-hour drive to Bryson City. But it's so beautiful, and, it's, and it is about solitude and solace, and this is why these people go there. And I just wanted to throw that out there. If you've never, if you go, I tell people this all the time, but if you're going to the Smoky Mountains and you're only going to Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge, and you're only going to eat or to shop or to visit these museums and such, you're missing out on the true reason to go there. You have got to go to Nantahala in North Carolina. You have got to go to Bryson City, which is just this little town. Now, be careful when you go. Make sure somebody knows you're there and you're going with other people because there are a high incidence of missing people in those areas and it could be as simple as they just fall in love like I did with this beauty and say I'm gonna go search for more and end up someplace they can't find their way out of but I'll move on I just wanted to throw that in there it, it's just 
It's beautiful beyond words. And his book, as this person telling this, this Kim Diamond, who wrote this article, it, you know, she and I have the same thoughts on this place. So I'll move on. Uh, Julie and Lolly were not hiking the Appalachia Trail when they were murdered, but their bodies were discovered not far. As I learned more about their lives, I began to see myself reflected in their stories. They loved to travel, and they loved to be outdoors. They were looking for adventure in the great outdoors, and they wanted to explore this area. Now, on Sunday, May 19th, 1996, the two women embarked on a backpacking trip in Shenandoah National Park with their golden retriever, Taj. Um, Julie was from St. Cloud, Minnesota, and Lolly was from Maine. They pitched their tent in the National Park, and they chose a peaceful spot next to a mountain stream. Investigators later noted that they may have, that the sound of the water may have drowned out approaching footsteps. The women had met two years earlier. Two people from very different backgrounds fell in love with their love of the outdoors. This is what drew them together. According to a journalist who wrote the story about them, Lolly was a micro-brew drinking, fish following, cigarette smoking, good time girl. She was from a very well-to-do family from Michigan, but she rejected the idea of privilege. She left home after high school and enrolled in college in Vermont. She dropped out, and a few years later, she enrolled in Unity College in Waterville, Maine. She began to study to become a wilderness guide. She loved the outdoors and wanted to share her experience with others. Julie was a geologist in the making. She was a sports enthusiast and had won the Minnesota State Double Tennis Championship in high school. She traveled to Europe and began to study dinosaurs. She graduated summa cum laude and she spoke Spanish. She worked with migrants and people suffering from abuse. After college, she ended up in Richmond, Vermont and took a job at a bookstore. The trip she planned with Lolly in Shenandoah was a celebration of a new job and Instead, it turned into the last day that they would be here. On May the 31st, 1996, Thomas Williams reported his daughter missing. Park rangers began to search and located Julie and Lolly's car at the Skyland Lodge. We started doing searches to cover all of those trail corridors in that general area to see if we could locate them. At some point during those hasty searches, we did locate the dog wandering through the park without his leash. The next evening, park rangers discovered the bodies of Julie and Lolly at a campsite on Bridal Trail, a part of the horse trail system that runs through big meadows. Their campsite was only a quarter of a mile downstream from the Skyland Drive. It was... They were only about a half a mile from a popular lodge and a gathering place with a bar, restaurants, and cabins. It was the weekend after Memorial Day, and the lodge was jam-packed with hikers and tourists. I've stood on the balcony of the lodge myself, looking out over Shenandoah, and it's unfathomable to think that within ten minutes hike away from this location, two women were bound and gagged and had their throats slashed. Their killer disappeared without a trace. It also seems impossible that two bodies could lay undiscovered in such a popular part of the park over a busy holiday weekend. But that was exactly what happened. It wasn't a heavily used or heavily traveled trail. Photos left behind in their camera gave a glimpse of the last few days of life. 
The women arrived in Shenandoah National Park on May the 19th, 1996, and launched off into the woods on the White Oak Canyon Trail, emerging again a few days later due to rain. They hitched a ride with a park ranger and renewed their camping permit and set out again. The first step in conducting an investigation into a national park is identifying what jurisdiction of the land is in. Shenandoah National Park is exclusive federal jurisdiction, which means only the federal government has law enforcement authority. We also worked with the Virginia State Police Crime Scene Unit, and they came in and processed the crime scene along with the FBI. Several factors make conducting investigations in the National Park Service challenging. The first factor is that so many people are coming and going from the park each day. The year that Julie and Lolly were murdered, 1.57 million people visited the Shenandoah Park. That kind of transient environment allows the perpetrator to slip easily through the gates unnoticed. Locating, assessing, collecting, and preserving evidence outdoors also makes crime crime solving on public lands more challenging. Any type of crime that occurs in an outdoor environment, your crime scene is probably 10 times larger than it would be inside of a residence. You have the initial crime scene and then you have the area surrounding it. You also have to deal with the weather and animals and the fact that other people may have been hiking through there prior to this and footprints all get mixed in together. In the years that followed the discovery of the women's bodies, the National Park Service and the FBI joined forces to conduct a nationwide search for the killer. They followed up on an estimated 15,000 leads. For over a year, nothing happened until one day in July of 1997. Shenandoah Skyline Drive is a popular place for a bike ride. And on that day, Yvonne Malba Malbasha, a tourist from Canada, had come to ride her bike. She pedaled along the mountainous road, admiring the Blue Ridge Mountains. She was forced off of the road and off of her bike by a man driving a truck. He screamed sexual profanities at her as he stepped from his vehicle in rage and tried to force her into his truck. She was able to fight him off and took cover behind a tree as he re-entered his truck and tried numerous times to run her over. He eventually gave up and drove away. Rangers apprehended him as he attempted to leave the park. Later, when investigators searched his vehicle, they found hand and leg restraints inside. Not much was known about the attacker, Darrell David Rice. At the time of Malbasha's attack, he was in his late 20s and was living in Columbia, Maryland. He was a single man with no kids. And although he had no previous criminal report, a newspaper report from Charlottesville, Virginia states that Rice was fired from his job at Maryland's MCI System House because he was extremely hostile to his co-workers. He would yell sexual profanities at them and punched a hole in the men's bathroom wall. He would steal people's lunches and purposely bump into them, causing them to spill their coffee. In 1998, Darrell David Rice pled guilty to attempted abduction of Malbasha. He was sentenced to 135 months in Petersburg, Virginia, federal penitentiary. Interviews after his arrest led prosecutors to believe Rice may have been involved in the murders of Julie and Lolly. Rice became a possible suspect for a variety of reasons, including the obvious parallels in location, his predatory behavior, and the fact that he was t targeting female victims. 
He was videotaped entering the park at 8.05 p.m. on May the 25th and again at Rockfish Gap at 4.57 p.m. on May the 26th. This put him in the area of the murders. He returned with some friends on June the 1st. Rice denied that he was in the park on May the 25th and 26th, but admitted that he was there on June the 1st. With circumstantial evidence in hand on April the 10th, 2001, nearly five years after their deaths, Attorney General John Ashcroft announced the indictment of Darrell David Rice in the murder of Julie and Lolly. The fact that Julie and Lolly were lesbian lovers stole the headlines. Um, in, instead of them focusing on the fact that this man assaulted women, because in his own words, they were more vulnerable than men. A prosecutor stated that Rice said the women deserved to die because they were gay. And some people were saying the reason that this story stole the headlines was because a man who would be targeting a woman to murder or rape would have probably chosen a straight woman alone, like he tried to do with this lady on the bicycle. But that's not necessarily true. Just because, And how did he know that they were lovers if he just came upon the two of them sitting at their campsite you know, roasting a marshmallow or whatever they may have been doing. Unless he had been following them around, you know. And that doesn't really make any difference anyway. Bryce was charged with four counts of capital murder, two of which alleged he selected his victims because they were gay. Because Rice was charged with a hate crime, his indictment brought a federal sentencing. If convicted, he could receive the death penalty, but he was never sentenced. Prosecutors spent years building a case against Rice, but they lacked forensic evidence. In 2003, they found a hire at the crime scene, and DNA results said it did not match Rice. It did not match either of the two women. After that, the case fell apart, and charges against Darrell David Rice were dismissed. Because the murder of Julie and Lolly is still an active investigation, the FBI could not discuss any other persons of interest. No one has been convicted of the murders. Rice was released from prison in 2011. The last reported sighting of him was in 2014, in Durango, Colorado, when police received calls from frightened residents saying this, they'd seen this man in the area. And the police came out to check what was going on and they said someone had recognized him and thought that he was escaped or maybe on probation, but they said, free man, he's not doing anything wrong. On the 20th anniversary of Julie and Lolly's murders, the FBI circulated a press release and updated posters. The case remains an open and active investigation. It's our hope that any continued coverage of the girls' murders will one day generate one pe crucial piece of information. And as time marches on, the women are still remembered by their loved ones. Old timers in the Shenandoah Park who were working in the park all those years ago um, say, when I found out that they were geologists, that hit me because I'm a geologist too, said one worker. I felt bad knowing that they were out there having a good time enjoying themselves and something horrible like this happened. I was a very young park ranger at the time and it really affected me. I may not have taken the law enforcement part of my job as seriously as I do now, but now I look at myself as being a guardian of these people who come into this park. I was having a blast. I was 
I wasn't thinking about anyone getting murdered in the park. This completely changed the way I thought about things. And I began to train as more of for law enforcement. I began to look at my job much differently. Over two decades have passed since the women were killed, and the shock of their murders is still a shadow over this peaceful paradise. Laura and when La, they called her La, Lolly, her name was Laura, but they called her Lolly. When Lolly and Julie now see it says here, and this was not told in the original story that I just read to everyone. It says here that they were sexually assaulted. When they were found sexually assaulted and murdered in Shenandoah Park, it sparked a national conversation about the safety in the wilderness and about hate crimes. But what happens when authorities keep an innocent, man, an innocent man's name in the spotlight? Um, this writer, Catherine Miles, explores the possibility that investigators unjustly implicated Darrell Rice in the slaying despite there being no forensic evidence against him. They later dropped the capital murder charges against him, but she, su she suggests that there's a killer hiding in plain sight, and he was responsible for the cold case murders. Miles spoke to A&E's True Crime about her new book, in which she seeks to shine a renewed light on this case. Now, this was posted... Uh, 2022, so just a year, a little under a year ago. Why do you believe the National Park Service doesn't report these numbers to the public? Now, I talked about that recently in another video that I did about how there there are no statistics of, of murders or missing people in the National Parks. The National Parks don't make those public. And um, maybe... They do that partially because they don't want to scare people from coming to visit these parks, but maybe they should. Maybe they should put up a disclaimer, and maybe they should put up uh, information in some of these uh, stores that sell or rent camping equipment and that type of thing, you know, to let people know, and hotels and, and other places people may visit while they're in this area but in reading about missing persons in national parks um, they ask this question which national park has the most missing people and the answer is the Grand Canyon between 1958 and 2021 there were 29 open cases for missing individuals of national parks um, there were only 29 open cases. Now, that's hard to believe when you consider the number of people. When I started reading about the, 20, the Route 29 serial killer, um, two of the people who were considered to be victims of his were these two women. It's never been proven if he was in the National Park at that time. Um... They keep logs of people that come in and out of the park. And they had cameras. But this was in 1996. Keep this in mind. So I'm just going to read. This is from Pop Culture Crime. On May 19th, 1996, Julianne Williams and Lolly Winans, 26 and 24 years of age, set out with their golden retriever, Taj, to backpack through the Shenandoah National Park. Less than two weeks later, they were reported missing. Now, something that I've noticed quite a bit in research in this case, these two women were uh, in a relationship. They were a lesbian couple. 
And during the trial of this man, this Darrell Rice, who was thought to have been, um, the police zeroed in on him very quickly. The National Park um, Rangers zeroed in on him. And um, when these two women were found murdered, the park ranger in charge of the search declared it a murder-suicide. But there was no possible way that it could have been. And the people, the other law enforcement people, really just said that that's impossible. Because their, both their throats were slit. Their hands were bound. They were inside their sleeping bags. He wanted people to believe that one of the women killed the other and then put herself into her own sleeping bag and slit her own throat. And it was because, and he admitted this, he said this openly and outright, that when, once the media got wind of this, it was going to really put a damper on people coming into the National Park. And they didn't want anybody to be afraid to come in there and to camp and to hike. But they didn't know who, who had done this. So they zeroed in on this Darrell Rice because he had been in the park, he had harassed another woman, um, he threw a can at her, I think, out of his truck window, and he made some slurs toward her, said some, like, sexual words to her, and, um, she claims he tried to run her over on her bicycle, he later admitted to that, and he apologized, and he said he was just having a bad day, he was in a bad mood, he came upon her riding her bike, and he was just taking it out on somebody. But they zeroed in on him as the murderer of these two women, and they were able to get him to offer up this confession, which he later recanted, and they were not able to prove that he was in the park that day, and they found no evidence against him. Um, fingerprints, blood... Um, her, they did find some DNA there, and they are still looking to this day. They are still researching this. But he was later, you know, the charges against him were dropped because they had no evidence. And then they said that they believed it was the, the work of this serial killer. But anyway, I'll move on from all that, and I'll just say that the media picked up the fact that these women were lesbian. And that's what this whole story became about. They wanted to hurry up and wrap this story up. They wanted to make it not about some creepy stalker in the National Park out stalking people and murdering them. And there's a question as to whether these women were sexually assaulted. In one article that I read, it says that they were and that they had been raped and murdered. And then later, I, you know, none of the other articles brings that up. Now, they wanted to run the story as though this was a hate crime. These um, gay and lesbian support groups and these TV outlets and media outlets picked that up, and they wanted that to be the focus. These women were targeted and murdered because they were gay. I don't think that was the case. I think these women were targeted and murdered because they were two young women alone in the woods. And I think that this person, you know, recently I, I was talking about this Gary Hilton who had murdered women along the Appalachian Trail. And he, he had was connected to a couple of women that they were never able to determine if he had murdered them or not they never found them and one of them uh, was a young woman from florida who w had gone missing in the smoky mountains and he was linked to her his his mo was to hike along the trail as though he were just another hiker he would come up on these people in their campsite and he would make conversation with them as though he were just passing through on his journey and he would you know they would let their guard down thinking this is just a nice old man hiking. He's just like us. He's out here to enjoy 
the great outdoors and everything, and then he would come back later and murder them. And so the whole focus on this story became the lesbian relationship. And that really played well for the National Park and for these park rangers because it took the focus off of the fact that two women were murdered inside the National Park. The story... Anytime, anytime... And, this, and if you think back to the two young women who were found murdered in um, around the same time that Gabby Petito went missing. Of course, Gabby Petito's story was getting all this attention, and these other two women were found inside their sleeping bag murdered. And so um, that became all about the fact that they were lesbians, and they also... At first, in the beginning, they um, wanted to lead the public to believe that this was a hate crime and that this was, um, well, first of all, they the park people did the exact same thing in this case. They wanted to put the focus on um, a murder-suicide. They wanted it to just be these, you know, this one woman killed the other and that, that was what it was, this murder suicide of a of a love relationship. I just wanted to compare it because it it just shows how they go about um trying to take the focus off of the actual story which is that these two women were murdered by someone and that person has still never been found and this case has never been solved. I doubt that the killer of these two women knew that they were lesbians and probably didn't care, you know. His focus was, oh, here's two uh, gay women. I'm going to murder them because they're gay. I, I think his focus was, here's two women alone in the woods. And here's my opportunity to, you know, rape and murder them. Now, this is from the Washington Post. Um, this is dated June 5th, 1996. So this is very soon after this happened. The two young women whose bodies were found over the weekend in Shenandoah National Park died when their throats were slashed at a remote campsite, but authorities still refused to release details of the slayings. Julianne Williams, 24, and Lolly Winans, 26, died sometime after May the 24th. That was the last day that they had been seen by other hikers near the Appalachian Trail. Park authorities maintained yesterday that the slayings were an isolated incident. Um, they, park officials refused to explain why they said other visitors were not in danger. Something investigators found at the site led them to believe this was an isolated incident. He would not say what that was. But in a telephone interview last night, he played down the significance of evidence found at the scene, saying park officials do not know if the attacker will strike again. The spokesman also said that he used the phrase isolated incident to mean investigators have no similar crimes at Shenandoah to link to these murders. Park officials would not say whether the women's bodies were found clothed or whether they had been sexually assaulted. They have declined to explain why it was not immediately clear that the deaths were homicide. Park officials said they would increase ranger patrols and other security measures at the park. Hikers and campers in the Tranquil Park criticized park rangers for failing to provide more information. Because they, the people were out there hiking and camping, they wanted to know, should I pack up and get out of here? Am I in danger? Was this someone who knew these women and stalked them? Or 
was this actually a murder-suicide? Um, they later did say it was not a murder-suicide. It was a homicide, a double homicide. So, basically, we asked the park ranger, and he said, just take caution. We can't tell you anything, said one camper. The bodies were found by ranger Saturday, a day after William's father reported the two women missing. They were found at a wooded campsite about a half a mile from the Skyland Lodge. They were hiking with their golden retriever, who was found unharmed nearby. This Daryl Rice did go through, um, let me see, he did go through a, a trial, but it was dropped. The charges against him were dropped. He did serve, I think they said, 11 years for this um, attempted, they called it an attempted kidnapping, and this assault uh, of this other woman who was on the bicycle um and i think in my own personal opinion i think that i think they're not doing these two women justice by um focusing on that because what they're doing is they're wanting to make this a hate crime against gay people instead of saying okay these two women were out there and let's get to the facts first. Let's find out who did this first. Let's run the DNA of these hires that were found on tape on these bodies. Um, if the women were sexually assaulted, and that is, like I said, in one article it says that they had been, but nothing else shows. I, I've found no other articles about that, and it was not mentioned in this man's charges, uh, the charges that were brought against him. So, if that's something that they are wanting to keep hush hush, maybe because they did find uh, DNA. And if that's the case, then hopefully they would run it. I would think that by now, this other man, this this twenty nine serial killer. They would have his DNA because his DNA did link him to three other murders of young women. These were both experienced outdoors women. They were both experienced hikers and campers. And one of them was a geologist and the other was studying to become a, a trail guide. She was going to be someone who would take other people out onto these trails and campsites. So they knew, you know, what they were doing as far as that goes. But some people believe that because they were right next to a very loud stream of water that they may not have heard their attacker coming. And it could also be that this person, just like this other man, just walked upon their camp with his backpack, with his camping gear, and appeared to them to be just another hiker on one of these trails because that's what people go out there to do you know but I would just say that uh, this woman's book got her a lot of attention and it did bring a lot of attention to this story but did it do did it bring the right kind of attention are people focusing on let's find this killer let's see who this person was is he still alive is he still out there is he linked to other murders um, and whatever the motive was, let, let's focus on the motive later once we find out who the guy was. But I believe, my personal opinion is, is that when you focus on that only, you're, you're leading people to believe that this person saw these two women together, realized this is a gay couple and I'm going to, I'm going to murder them because they're gay. Um. I would say more than likely he probably said, here's two women alone, probably very defenseless, and I'm going to take my chances on, you know, raping and kidnapping or murdering them for whatever reason. 
The bodies of Williams and Winans were found by Shenandoah National Park Rangers on June the 1st, 1996 at their isolated campsite near Skyland Resort in Central Virginia. In an effort to minimize public relations damage and, put, and mitigate a sense of panic in the park, the National Park Service handled the case slowly and the FBI handled it ineptly. This is their opinion. And if you think about it, they did an injustice to those other people because it's very possible that whoever did this, and, and this was the, the belief of a lot of people in both authorities and the camping people, the, the visitors to the park, they believed that this person was walking around amongst them, you know, in broad daylight. They, they believed that he came across to everybody as just another hiker. And that's probably why these two women didn't have their guard up when he approached their camp. And they may have. They may have had their guard up. They may have said, who is this guy? Why is he coming into our campsite? You know, and they may have had their guard up. But somehow, some way, he overtook both of them and ended up murdering them, possibly sexually assaulting them. And I wish that they, maybe they're keeping that a little bit more hush-hush because they don't want this person who's out there in the world still to know that they have his DNA. And one day, hopefully, they find out who he was. He could be linked to other murders as well. It just goes on to say, as a result, no one has been prosecuted for the Shenandoah murders. When Darrell David Rice, a Maryland man who had served time for an attempted abduction of a woman in the National Park, was indicted for the killings. The state's theory was that Rice made anti-gay comments during his interviews with police, killed Williams and Winans as a homophobic hate crime. The case was tried as such under a brand new post-9-11 federal hate crime, but Miles explains that DNA evidence eventually cleared Rice and destroyed the idea that they were murdered because they were lesbians. This, just, this article goes on to talk about how they believe the FBI botched this crime scene and withheld evidence, and withheld, not withheld evidence, they withheld it to the public because of public relations in the park didn't want this getting out. I don't know about anybody else, but the way I feel about it is if if you follow these cases like this, you know that people are targets in these national parks. They're vulnerable. They are in an isolated place where it would be hard to run, it would be hard to get away, uh, it would be almost impossible for anybody to hear you. So they are vulnerable in these places. And a lot of these types of people, these serial killers, these serial rapists, these um, psychopathic type of people, hide out in these national parks. They want they they blend in by getting a backpack and some hiking boots, and walking along these trails. They blend in as just any other sightseer or camper. And sometimes they go into these places to camp and to hike, simply because it takes them off. It takes them out of the public eye. It takes them off the main highway, you know, and they're out there hiding out. Miles goes on in her story to say that publicly protected wilderness land is the worst place to be murdered if there is any hope of finding the perpetrator. Many have reported that a national park is the worst place to go missing because of issues relating to jurisdictions. 
Some people estimate the number of missing people on public lands today could be as high as 1,600. Miles lays out the case against Ivanovitz, saying that he may have murdered the two women for reasons that are much harder to define, but have to do with a history of childhood abuse, mental illness, and sexual sadism. But Miles, proje but Miles' project grows more complicated when she reveals that Williams and Winans were two of eight women and girls killed in a specific section of central Virginia over a one-year period of time during the 1990s. The book also begins to consider the murders and attempted murder of four other women on protected land. Um, by expanding her focus, Miles begins to make a wider argument that women are at a heightened risk of violence in the outdoors. Too often women are prey in our culture. And there are more guys than we would like to admit that go out into the wilderness to hunt them. And I'm sure that this man did hate these women. But not because they were gay. I think that his hatred was just for women in general. Or maybe not even that he even hated them. But that just that he, he was a sadistic murderer and he wanted to murder somebody he wanted to murder both women for whatever pleasure or whatever it gave him whatever it, for whatever reason that he set his sights on them i just read these stories and i relay them to people i put in my own thoughts on it this is from the innocence project answers to the cold case of the shenandoah murders may sit buried in FBI evidence locker. This is from WUSA9.com. This is dated from July of 2022. Innocent Project says answers to the cold case of the Shenandoah murders may sit buried in an FBI evidence locker. Um... It's been 25 years, but Tom Williams still thinks about his murdered daughter every day. Through tears, he said he still thinks about the wonderful Easter weekend he spent in Florida with 24-year-old Julie Williams, the last time he saw her alive. Sixty days later, she would be dead, he says. Now the FBI is pleading for answers in a still unsolved double murder that's haunted investigators. But a lawyer for a man once charged in the death said he believes DNA would lead to the killer of Julie and her partner, Lolly Winans, in the, national, in the Shenandoah National Park in 1996. According to this lawyer, he says that DNA evidence still sits in a locker in the FBI lab in Quantico. They have male DNA on a gag, and they have hers. So now... The gag would have been uh, like a handkerchief or a some type of cloth or something that they put inside this person's mouth. I don't know if the DNA is blood, if it's uh, skin cells, it could be saliva, it could be any type of DNA, but they say that they do have male DNA and they have her on duct tape found at this crime scene. Why is it still sitting in the Quantico FBI lab in a locker 25 years later while people go around speculating that this was a hate crime? Do the DNA. Find out if this person matches. Find out if, if it was this Route 29 killer or if it's some completely different person that nobody has ever even heard of. Um... The last time it was analyzed was about 20 years ago, and at that time the results failed to pinpoint a killer, but it did rule out Darrell Rice. The FBI may not need new tips to solve this case. The alternative suspect, Richard Ivonitz, a man police said murdered Katie and Kristen, 
Lisk, 12 and 15, and Sophia Silva, 16, in Spotsylvania County the same year. They believe that he was the killer of these two women. Ivonitz died by suicide in Florida as police were closing in on him. After police said he had abducted another teen in South Carolina who had escaped, and alerted police to his whereabouts. Richard Mark Ivonitz killed people. He told his sister right before he killed himself, I killed more people than I can remember. Rice's lawyers first pointed to Ivonitz as the real killer almost 20 years ago. At that time, prosecutors called that argument suspicious and said they, that there was not one scintilla of evidence to support it. That was right before they dropped the charges against Rice. Tom Williams does not believe that Ivonitz was his daughter's killer. In court documents, prosecutors suggested Rice might also have been the Route 29 serial killer, suspected of abducting and trying to abduct at least 20 women while driving the highway. Um... Did DNA, didn't they say that DNA led Ivonitz to these women? So what they're wanting to do is take this Darrell Rice's DNA that he provided during his trial that did not match the DNA of these two murdered women, and they want to compare it to the bodies of other uh, girls who were murdered along Route 29 to see if he may possibly have been the serial killer. And there was one case um, that I did have a question about in Martinsville, Virginia. One of the reasons why some people suspected that this Darrell Rice may have been the Route 29 serial killer was because he had lived in Martinsville, Virginia. And a young woman... Um, was driving to meet her mother to go shopping. Alicia Showaters Reynolds disappeared on her drive to Charlottesville, Virginia to shop with her mother in 1996. Sources say she never made it to her destination. She is thought to be the first of many disappearances along Route 29. Police claim her killer must have known the area in which her body was found. Hopefully, um, this DNA will be tested, but keep in mind, um, John Ramsey, the father of John Benet Ramsey, he did an interview recently with Megan Kelly on her podcast, and he he is currently trying to get the state of Colorado and the police department there to release what is left of the DNA that was found on his daughter to um, this Innocence Project, to her um, nano labs, and trying to get someone to run this DNA one final time. He says, this is my last chance. I'm 79 years old. If they don't link this DNA to someone, he may not be around to find out. And he wants to know. And some people would say, well... You may be better off not knowing, but I don't, I don't, I don't feel that way. I don't, um, I, I don't know. Some people may disagree with me on that, but I, I don't, as a parent, I don't know that I would feel that way, that I wouldn't want to know, you know. But I'm going to wrap this story up, and I'll just say that as of today, there has been, this case, this case is still unsolved, um, if there is a link to this Ivonitz, if the DNA that is sitting in this lab in Quantico is ever tested and it is him, they should just come on out and tell the family that. These parents are also growing older and they want to know what happened. And it may put to rest once and for all this theory that this was a hate crime against two gay women. Um... And why would the why would the FBI hold on to this evidence and not release it to these labs to be tested once and for all? You know, 
just release the DNA to these nano labs and some of these others and let them do their work and they they recently I just watched a video the other night where they were finally able to solve a 50 year old rape and murder and of course we all know about the boy in the box that was a 65 year old case using DNA they were able to trace his family if they've solved his murder as far as who murdered him and placed him in the woods the the Philadelphia police are, are not speaking on that yet but release this DNA you know let these let these labs work their magic and find out once and for all give this family some resolution thank you for listening